If you own a business, you may have thought of the day that you decide you're going to exit the business, whether that's right around the corner or way beyond the foreseeable future, but getting some information up front is really useful, I find, for a lot of the clients that I work with. Quite often, we have financials and tax returns that have been designed by our accountants and ourselves so that we don't have to pay any more taxes than we have to. But as we approach the timeline when we want to sell our business, and especially if we want to get bankers to support us in the process, it's highly useful to be able to show the real profit and doesn't necessarily mean you have to pay any more taxes, but make sure things are clear. So I'm going to outline a few things in advance as we go through this. This is in part one of how to get the most for your business. One of the reasons that I bring this to attention is that a lot of times we think we've got all the information that we need. We've listened to our friends or people at the country club, people who have sold other businesses. Maybe we've thought we've heard what the accountants are really saying about value. I love this quote. It's not really from Mark Twain, but on the internet it shows that a lot. But it was used in the big short. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And that's so true. You know, a large percentage of the wealth in our businesses, and I'm a business owner as well, is tied up in that business that we have. And if we can exit that business successfully when the time is right for ourselves, then it can be a really beautiful, gratifying thing. It's a little bit like putting money into your 401k for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years or what have you, and then at the very end not being able to pull that money out because you haven't done the right things to unlock the value of your business or allow people to acquire it. Now, you might be thinking you don't know what you're going to do. Maybe in the back of your mind you're looking at an ESOP program to turn it over to employees or Perhaps you're going to turn it over to your kids or family members, or perhaps you're going to go to market and sell it. Either way, or any of those ways, it's still useful to have a high value of the business. And here's another factor. If you just type in why businesses don't sell, you're going to see that 70 to 80% of businesses that are on the marketplace just never sell. And this isn't just me saying this. This is Inc. Magazine, Forbes Magazine, LinkedIn, all kinds of important resources that have this important essential data that makes a world of difference regarding the business and the selling of the business. So I'm going to talk today just a little bit about showing value and what you've got in your business is so important. You've worked hard. Again, think of the analogy of putting the money into 401k. Value, value, value is so important. You build value, but it towards the end as you want to exit exit your business, right? You need to demonstrate that value. What's that business going to look like? Showing profit is one of the key things. And quite often when people are looking at, well, how much did your business make? We know the number on the bottom of our tax returns or the financial statements that we create or that our accountants create is not the story of what we're making. We're making all kinds of money and we're putting it in maybe uh, personal cars or paying a family member or we're, we're writing off depreciation, amortization, some interest we put in there. We've got one time, we've got all these different things. I'm going to go over a highlight of some of those. And this isn't meant to be a full education so you can just do everything on your own. I'm going to encourage you to look at this information and start thinking about this and then maybe sit down with a professional, but maybe this will give some guidance. You know, the bottom line on our tax returns or our uh, personal profit loss statements, etc., cetera, uh, just doesn't reflect, you know, the, the total value of the business. Here's one of the simplified formulas, and there's two formulas in one here. There's one is discretionary earnings, and that amount of money is the money that one working owner can take out of the business if she or he is working in the business full-time. It doesn't include the money that your spouse is getting or your kids are getting if they live in the same household. And the second one is similar to that. It's a, that money that you get after paying a manager, so that's EBITDA. And it's not what you've been paying yourself. It's what the market value would be. So imagine you're going to buy a pizza restaurant. You're going to work in it. You're going to make all of this money, but you like the industry enough. You buy more pizza restaurants. You can't be in all of them. So now you pay a manager for each of those. Now you're looking at EBITDA. And some investors are going to look at that EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. And some people are going to look at the discretionary earnings. So, you know, we need to show our real earnings and we write off different things. Maybe you're writing off a really awesome car or truck that you really don't need. You could ride your bicycle to your business and it would still function. 
but as a CEO, you enjoy having some benefits out there. You know, we also have one-time expenses. Maybe after 25 years, you've decided to remodel the front showroom, and it costs you $50,000 in one particular year. Well, it's not really fair to say, well, in that particular year, we had a bad year. Instead of making $450,000, we have made $400,000. No, the reality is, and you need to be able to show it to the investment community and to the bankers, hey, we would have had another 50000 but we made this one-time expense. It's not going to be something you need to redo over and over again because we just went through this and it's been the last 25 years since we did the same sort of thing. You also might be writing off meals, and there's some things that are more complicated than others. I hear people saying, well, I want to write off my um, advertising program because the advertising just didn't work out. I've been doing it for five years, and I spent money this past year, but I don't want to get out of it. But there's certain things that make sense out there and some that don't. Meals is one of those funny ones where people say, I'm writing off all my meals, or I'm giving you all my Costco receipts because some of that stuff is done personally. And you have to think through what's personal and discretionary and what has been useful in the business, even if you could say, well, the new person doesn't necessarily have to do that. So here's an example with meals. Maybe you take your spouse out every week and you do a summary of the business and you talk about it and you go back to your account and you justify that, hey, this is a real write-off on the business. But the new person doesn't have to take their spouse out if they buy your business and discuss the business at all. On the other hand, maybe you spend some money taking people out for lunch or dinner or coffee and you've been writing that all off. Or maybe you celebrate, hey, every month we celebrate birthdays and milestones and victories of the employees. Well, the new owner, even if you say the new owner doesn't have to do that, they're buying a business with your psyche, your amazing theories and insights, and they're going to want to follow your business just the same way that you've been doing it until they see a reason to do otherwise. So they need to keep those expenses in there, and therefore those expenses are not items that you would ever write off. That is, you would write off the money that you take your spouse out for for meals, but you would not write the money off that you would do for spending money on employees, milestones, etc. Make sure the income is consistency. One of the other things I notice is that, well, well, let's go over this other thing out there. First of all, you've got to make sure that the money that you are bringing in and showing on your top line is really money that's generated by the business. So I see quite often people are saying, hey, I made you know, $3 million in revenues last year, and the other years I was only making you know, $2.5 million, which is still a great number, whatever the numbers are. It doesn't matter. But I had PPP money because of COVID. But I got this big check from... Uh, the BP oil spill, which happened many years back along the Florida coast and many other coastlines, or I finally won this lawsuit and I've got another $300,000 in that. Those numbers are not repeatable. EIDL, uh, money you get for, for employee taxes, pull that out. People are going to pull that out and don't let yourself be fooled. Don't look so foolish as to throw that in and pretend somebody is not going to notice that. They're going to either notice it themselves as investors or they're going to run it through their accountants for due diligence. And it just wastes your time, energy, effort, and really deflates the view of the business. So make sure you're not showing income that you're not making. Don't try to write off things like, well, I don't really think I'm getting much out of my advertising. So the new person cannot advertise, you know, or I've seen people will say, well, we raised our prices 25%. So I'm going to go back and look over those last three or four or five years and increase that by 25%. And oh, wow, you'd make a lot more money because we know that when you influence the price of things, the market makes other adjustments, like they stop buying sometimes, etc. So be very careful in terms of how you approach this, but make sure that you do approach it. One of the other factors we look at is to say, you know, how do you compare to the industry? And it might be really super insightful for you to say, hey, Right now, we're making 11.5% EBITDA, and I feel really great about it because the last few years, we're only making 10%. So we've improved, and then you go and you do a, a, a study, and you get somebody to pull research, and you might find that in your industry, the average is actually 12%, and then you might say, well, I wonder what I'm doing wrong. Maybe I need to change some things, and maybe then you even ask, by the way, what is the top 25% doing, and you might find it's 15%. EBITDA, and I'm making up the numbers, but I'm giving you a scenario to say, find out where you stand, and it's not just on earnings to gross revenues, it could be cost of goods sold, or rent, 
in fact, going through the details of the valuation, but also the what I call the benchmark comparison, comparing your business to the industry averages in the past, can give you some insights to make you think, hmm, I'm wondering if there's some other opportunities that I can increase value. Because if you can increase value, you can transfer that into making more when you go to sell. Okay? Now, here's one other thing that I see happen. I see people approach the time frame when they are ready to sell. Sometimes, unfortunately, when they're being forced to sell. I've had people whose spouses or, or family members run into some serious health problems. They say, hey, this is time for me to get out and help them out. So it's not always about a personal uh, situation, but I've had also way too many clients that have had horrible, serious issues, and they've been forced out. So you can't just take this last year or say, hey, you know, January was really great. I think we're going to be very profitable, even though the last few years we've been netting $200,000. This year, we're on target for $800,000 in profit, and therefore, I want to base my business pricing based on that $800,000. Go back and look at your financials. Some people have even gone back and resubmitted their tax returns and that sort of thing so that they can show a consistent earnings. One year up is a called a hockey stick. It's so popular that it's gotten a slang that's in the terminology of almost every SBA lender and a lot of people that sell businesses. We see it all the time. You can't just have a one year come to a reckoning or come to Jesus over your business and say, hey, I'm suddenly making money. Be credible. If you have to go back and rework and make some payments and do some efforts to make things look credible, or you hit your timeline, you say, I want to sell in the next 24 months, start working on that. And by the way, as you approach the timeline for uh, putting together your tax returns for any one particular current year, keep in mind that for the state uh, or for the federal taxes, you've got something like usually somewhere around September 15th or something like that. And so you might, if you're selling your business, you know, hold off in, and, and say, here's my best case scenario for my tax returns. Again, talk to your accountant. I, I don't get involved in, in taxes and financials, but make sure that you're able to present a good, compelling results and hockey sticks just don't win favors. Sit with a professional. If you haven't had an evaluation done on your business in the last year or two for sure, get an evaluation right now. You might hate what you find out, but it'll give you incredible and powerful information, and it might just change you. You can reach out to us at LVG Advisors. That's Legacy Venture Group Advisors. We're also on the website at Buy Biz USA. You might have seen us around on that for, for years. Get the most for your business. This is part one of showing the real profit. We'll go into other things. You can also get a copy uh, with the QR code if you put your phone up to the camera picture here and get a copy of our uh, Business Seller Success Guide. Thank you. Make great things happen. Thanks for listening. Check out our website if you want to reach out to me. My contact information is on the website. We have a whole host of whale, amazing team, and we're also part of this real great organization called the Business Transition Council, btctampa.com. And we have a team of advisors that we work together with, 38 of us right now, from everything from wealth management, what you do with your money after your sale, to getting the valuations, to improving your business if you want to take it to the next level. Thank you again. This is Brian Stevens with Legacy Venture Group. I love what I do. I'm a business owner like you. And if you have any questions, please reach out. We'd be glad to help you anywhere around the planet. Bye-bye.